Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Day 5 of the Asian Oncology Society Conference. To open the AOS special session, please welcome Professor Kazuhiro Yoshida, AOS Secretary General, Director of Gifu University Hospital and Professor and Chairman of the Department of Surgical Oncology at Gifu University. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Kazuhiro Yoshida, Gifu University, Japan, and it's my great pleasure to chair this session. So today, AOS special keynote session on emerging technologies in cancer, which has a roster of distinguished lectures. I will introduce them all at once at this time. Okay, uh, let me introduce the first speaker, Professor Han Kan Yan, uh, who is the Jen Pok Kim Memorial Lectures and will speak on the vision of precision surgery. Professor Yam, the Chief Division of GI Surgery, Department of Surgery and Cancer Research Institute, Seoul National University Hospital, Seoul National University College of Medicine Korea. He is also the AOS Secretary General. He's involved in several large-scale RCTs for gastric cancer treatment, Korean PI for regatta study, and investigators of uh, classic trial, class trials, as well as uh, Korean PIs of phase two study of role of neoadjuvant imatinib treatment in large gastric gists. His uh, translational research interest, uh, gastric carcinogenesis, DDS, familial gastric cancer, and biomarkers. Our next speaker is Professor Wei Bin Lee, who will talk on intra thecal chemotherapy for CSF metastatic tumors. He is chief Beijing Tiantan Hospital, Capital Medical University and China, AOS scientific committee member. He is a director, Department of Neuro Oncology, Beijing Tiantan Hospital, Associate Chair, Oncology System, CMU in China, director of Chinese Anti-Cancer Association, Vice Chair Clinical Research Speciality Committee, China Pharmaceutical Innovation and Research Development Association, COO of Glioma Speciality Committee, Chinese Medical Doctor Association member, Editing Committee for Cancer Biology and Medical Follower of Loro Society in Medicine UK. His researches are on the chemotherapy, targeted and immunotherapy for glioma, one of the leading scientists on the clinical trials for glioma in China. Our next speaker, third speaker, who will talk on advanced radiotherapy with carbon ions is Professor Tatsuyo Ono. He is medical director, Guma University Graduate School of Medicine, Japan. He served as a course director of international training course on carbon iron radiotherapy held at NIRS and Guma University since 2012. Course director of clinical workshop program, 3D image guided adaptive brachiotherapy for gynecology. Lecturer of IAEA Regional Training Course on Gynae Cancer, Federation of Asian Organization for Radiation Oncology, ESTRO, Meets Asia. He is core member of Japan Carbon Iron Radiation Oncology Stud Study Group, JCLOS, since 2014. Mm -hmm. Delegate of Japanese Society for Radiation Oncology, JASTRO, and Vice Chairman of the Particle Therapy Committee for JASTRO. External Advisory Board Member of Shanghai Proton and Heavy Ion Treatment Center and the Korea Heavy Ion Medical Accelerator Project in Korea. Official Member of Radiation Oncology uh, project of the Forum of Nuclear Cooperation in Asia, supported by Japanese government. And our uh, next speaker, fourth speaker, who will talk on multi-parametric MRI for oncologic evaluation, is Professor John Min Lee. 
He is chief radio on radiologist, abdominal imaging and non-vascular intervention section, Institute of Radiation Medicine, Seoul National University, Korea. He is member of Korean and International Radiological Societies, Korean Radiological Society, Korean Society of Medical Ultrasound, uh, Korea Society of Abdominal Radiology, Korean Society for Magnetic Resources in Medicine, and Korean Society of Interventional Radiology, Korean Society Ultrasound in Medicine, and Korean Society of Gastroenterology, Korean Liver Cancer Study, and also European Congress of Radiology, European Society of Gastrointestinal and Abdominal Radiology, International Society for Magnetic Resources Medicine, Asian Pacific Association for Study for Liver, International Liver Cancer Association, Asian Society of the Abdominal Radiology, Radiological Society for North America. So ladies and gentlemen, here now are the AOS special sessions of today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your kind uh, introduction. And it is my great honor to give uh, a JP Kim Memorial Lecture at the first annual Congress of uh, AOS. Professor JP Kim, uh, he was a pioneer and also a uh, important role uh, uh, for the gastric cancer surgery. This slide was uh, from uh, Professor Aiko, Professor Emeritus of uh, Kagoshima University, among uh, the uh, pioneers in uh, uh, gastric cancer surgery, Nishi Okajima and uh, Mariyama. And uh, Professor JP Kim was elected as uh, fun, uh, honorary fellow of American College of Surgeons in 1993, also honorary fellow of American uh, Surgical Association and so on. And he was a quite diligent, per dignity, with a long, strong leadership and a sincere friendship. But most of all, he really promote international oncology collaborations. of the international boundaries. This is what uh, uh, Professor J. B. Kim uh, promoted. And uh, uh, in Asia, we did not have a strong uh, 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 oncology leadership. That's why we have Asian Oncology Society, which uh, inaugurated uh, last year in uh, Fukuoka. Here's uh, Professor No, Professor Sachi, and uh, Professor Yoshida, Secretary General of uh, uh, AOS. And uh, we had uh, uh, launching council members of uh, AOS. Today's my topic would be beyond MIS, minimal invasive surgery, evolution of a surgical sciences. This is gastric cancer specimen, typical uh, lymph node dissection radical. And uh, here's a primary cancer. This is lymphatic metastasis uh, viewed by uh, microscope. So uh, this is uh, how uh, GI solid tumor gastric cancer progress. And uh, depending on the extent, uh, we may do a uh, local endoscopic because of dissection, limited surgery or extensive surgery. At the Seoul National, this is actually Professor J. became operator on gastric cancer in 1975, he had done more than 10,000 cases. And uh, now uh, with uh, my uh, junior faculty last year, uh, we reached 30,000 uh, gastric cancer operation uh, in a single institute. The number is not important, but more important would be quality. So uh, this is why we maintain good database. This was uh, in 1986, Professor J.P. Kim uh, was uh, uh, conducting uh, data collection with the uh, juniors. And uh, uh, with the database, we have a uh, prospective complication data, 
uh, pathology data and the survival data. Eventually, we will have uh, genomic data, which will be very important in our future practice. And uh, for gastric uh, cancer surgery, as you are all aware, uh, extensive D2 dissection is important. But also, uh, during our cancer surgery, we have to pay attention for the potential cancer contamination. And please uh, 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 refer uh, this recent uh, commentary, Lancet Oncology, and uh, it emphasized not only the extent of no dissection, but also how to do, uh, namely avoid uh, contamination is important. This is a laparoscopic surgery, actually minimal invasive rather than uh, minimal access for gastric or any surgery compared to open surgery would be just this is an interface. Surgical principles are the same. When we had first uh, laparoscopic surgery, we first uh, trained ourselves using large and for the skills. And then we conducted uh, clinical trials to prove uh, potential benefit by laparoscopic surgery. In all this stage, we did the class zero one, confirmed the non-inferiority. The survivors are same, but uh, complications less with the laparoscope. And uh, for advanced cancer, last month, we finally published the JCO. Dr. Han sang -ho is PIO, but this trial show the same as uh, uh, three-year survival with uh, less complication by laparoscope. So this is the last year at the Seoul National. You see the most cases are early stage and uh, among this early stage, laparoscope surgery is uh, 93%. But advanced cases, only like 40% in stage three. Why? Because we had the uh, class zero one study already published. That's why we uh, do most cases by laparoscope. But uh, advanced cases, we use uh, uh, open surgery because a class zero two was not available. But as I mentioned last month, we have a class two result. So from the next year, we will have a much higher minimal access surgery for advanced cancer too. So this is a, a very important message by from Professor uh, Masaki Kitajima. Uh, he emphasized our surgical skill should be supported by science. That means scientific data, evidence. That's emphasis on uh, ethics. Laparoscopic surgery, we use a rigid instrument. And uh, so uh, we adopt uh, that articulating uh, robot arm technology to into our surgical procedure. So here's a one example of uh, our uh, uh, robotic uh, gastrectomy for to uh, advanced case. So we did, uh, uh, I did the total mentectomy for your view uh, limited time. I I played the uh, video quite fast. So uh, separation of a mesocolon and uh, identification of our right gastroepiploid vein. For this procedure, we are using a uh, uh, ultrasonic device. Actually, this is not articulating device cleaning up uh, the, uh, along the great uh, posterior side of the uh, duodenum and then move to the anterior surface. We go for the right gastric artery and the dissection along the hepatic artery proper. Right gastric artery and then you see the portal vein and so on. So uh, this is a kind of a remote control surgery, remote access surgery. And, uh, but uh, until now, uh, uh, the benefit of uh, robotic surgery over the laparoscope 
has not been uh, proven. That's why we have a very limited robotic surgery out of a minimal access surgery. And uh, this is an, an, again, uh, emphasis of uh, ethics in our practice. But uh, the reason why we did not uh, uh, see uh, uh, any benefit or, over uh, conventional laparoscope would be we use the same device. So uh, articulating energy device at this moment is quite bulky, but upcoming thinner articulating device may uh, change the patient outcome. Beyond MIS, here's uh, lymphatics. You see the lymphatic channel by near infrared. And uh, this is an uh, older version. Now newer version of a new infrared camera can show the uh, a variety of uh, uh, extensive lymphatic channel. Even uh, uh, this lymphatic channel can be visualized by superimposed view. Here's a short uh, video of how uh, we can apply uh, this near infrared camera for our surgery. You see the infrapyloric area. Uh, uh, we can easily see the lymphatics. So uh, during this dissection, we can avoid uh, potential injury to patient size, such as pancreas or a large uh, uh, vessels. And uh, you see the lymphatic along the you know, infrapyloric area. This is uh, along the right gastric artery area. And also we uh, can uh, use uh, this kind of uh, 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 volume rendering to identify vessels. And uh, by the way, precision medicine is a, a practice, choose a proper treatment of the pa for patient based on a genetic uh, difference. So called uh, personalized medicine and uh, we uh, bring our gastric cancer tissue into uh, laboratory and uh, establish a uh, patient-derived xenograft. And uh, with this xenograft, uh, this is, a, for example, PET scan of a human patient. Gastric cancers are sometimes very strong, but very low in some cases. So we, sometimes we are uh, uh, wasting uh, resources so using this PDX, we can tell the uh, positive uh, strong uh, PDX versus uh, uh, non-positive uh, 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 data. So uh, with a correlation with the genomic background of the, this human uh, uh, gastric cancer uh, uh, profile, we can uh, formulate prediction uh, model. And uh, also prediction of a chemosensitivity using PDX. Uh, here's uh, uh, how the patient's uh, response and uh, uh, based on a four fox response uh, to uh, chemotherapy uh, agent uh, uh, in uh, PDX, because we already have a, a genomic background of uh, this PDX, we can formulate some uh, uh, panel to predict uh, uh, chemosensitivity. So uh, using uh, this kind of a, uh, some cancer specific um, target, we may uh, uh, lighting up our cancer tissues during our cancer surgery. There are different uh, uh, targets available in gastric, just so you name it. For example, HER2, here anti-HER2 antibody tagged with the uh, uh, fluorescent uh, uh, dye, we can visualize HER2 positive tumor. Here's another view by new infrared camera. So uh, in, in the near future, we may uh, see the lymphatic channel by ICG, but uh, metastasis by different uh, wavelength. So uh, uh, first, access for gastric cancer surgery would be more minimal access surgery up to T4A and 2. And regarding a robotic uh, uh, gastrectomy, which is a feasible but not yet better than conventional laparoscope. And the lymph node dissection can be 
uh, assisted by near infrared system. And uh, in the near future, hopefully, when new, new patients comes, uh, first we will take a tissue for pathology confirmation, but also genomic profile. Based on genomic profile, we can choose uh, PASCAN or not. Also based on uh, this genomic profile, we may choose a uh, dissection. Also anti using anti-cancer tracer patient, uh, or we can uh, uh, visualize the metastatic area for selective uh, dissection. Also uh, additional adjuvant chemotherapy can be chosen, chosen based on the genomic profile too. I would like to thank my collaborators and this is my team. And in year 2022, we will have second international conference of AOS in Seoul. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleasure to uh, uh, give this presentation at uh, AOS. Uh, dear professors and uh, doctors, I want to share some information about the intracellular chemotherapy for CSF disseminated GBM. I'm from the Department of Neuron College, Beijing Tena Hospital, Capital Medical University. As we know, CSF dissemination of glioma, uh, the incidence of GBM CSF dissemination uh, was 20 to 28% with survival as 2.8 to 7 months. Uh, from the NCC and guideline, uh, the first choice for recurrent GBM is uh, clinic trials. It means it is hard to find uh, a good therapy, current therapy for current GBM. Intrathecular chemotherapy is recommended for manager metastatic disease and lymphoma breast cancers by NCCN guidelines. As we know, uh, in chemotherapy used to treat recurrent glioma with a very good outcome. One of the reasons is this drug's compassed BBB increased the local drug concentration in brain tumor. So far, we have two drugs for intrathecular chemotherapy as MTX and cetirubine. In my team, our research showed that both drugs could inhibit glioblastoma progression. The first uh, anti-tumor effects of sertirabine of CSF metastasis of GBM by targeting the PI3K pathway. Uh, in in vivo study also shows uh, this drug can inhibit 
tumor growth and reduce this tumor. MTX also can inhibit tumor growth and reduce the tumor value in vivo study. Since the year of 2018, my team treated nine cases of CSF disseminated GBM with EP plus intra chemotherapy. From our data, the longest survivor after CSF metastasis is over 25 months. The shortest overall survivor is 6.7 months. And the median overall survivor is 15.6. It's much, it's much better than uh, 2.8 to 7 months. Now I want to show you uh, a case of uh, in my hospital. Uh, this is a uh, 48 years old female. Her surgery was in uh, 2000. 15 August. Pathology shows GBM, uh, followed by the concurrent radio chemotherapy and the TMZ treatment. But in 2019, an MI imaging shows CSF dissemination. As the picture, this is a before we treat. We can see the CSF dissemination. We did uh, the treatment after two months of the treatment, we can find it's clear. It's much better. We also got a uh, uh, the CSF test, we find the CSF protein is keep going down. Every week we got the uh, test. And the uh, symptoms relieved. Thank you. Uh, he hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ono. I'm a radiation oncologist. Uh, uh, my major is uh, carbon ion radiotherapy for various types of cancer, especially X-ray resistant cancers. So I'd like to talk about uh, very advanced radiotherapy with carbon ion beams today. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, radiotherapy is an essential component of cancer treatment. For treating tumor with radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, or electron beams have been used as conventional radiotherapy. On the other hand, interest of particle beam therapy using protons and carbon ions is growing recently. What is an advantage of carbon ion radiotherapy compared with X-rays? First, physical property is better in carbon ion beams. As shown on the left, X-ray dose exponentially decreases with the depth. In carbon ion radiotherapy, entrance dose is lower and distal dose dramatically stops immediately after target lesion. Thus, Carbon ion beams achieve better dose conformity to the target. So this is the X-ray dose distribution. 
and this is carbon ion dose distribution, and this is less toxic bleach. In the clinical situation, multiple beams are used to improve dose conformity to the target. So this slide shows a comparison of dose distribution between carbon ion radiotherapy and SBRT or IMRT using X-rays for lung cancer, liver cancer, and prostate cancer. High dose localization is similar between two modalities. However, low to middle dose volume in healthy tissue is significantly lower in carbon ion radiotherapy. So here, the such dosimetric advantage results in the improved clinical outcomes. I'd like to show an example in stage one non-small cell lung cancer patient who usually have lung dysfunctions. So this table shows the incidence of radiation pneumonitis in grade two or worse among radiotherapy types. In SBRT with X-rays, the incidence ranges 9 to 28%, while the corresponding incidence in carbon ion radiotherapy was below 5%. Okay. Yes, the incidence of pneumonitis is clearly lower in carbon ion radiotherapy. So, uh, radiation therapy works by damaging the DNA of cancer cells. A low LET radiation like X-rays commonly cause sparsely ionizing and single strand DNA break. For cancer cell deaths, DNA double strand break by two heat is essential. However, cells have mechanism for repairing single strand DNA damage and some of them may survive even after radiation. High linear energy transfer, LET beam in carbon ion radiotherapy induce densely ionizing and therefore DNA double strand breaks, which becomes irreversible cell damage independently of cell cycle phase or oxygenation, more so than lower LET radiation such as X-rays. In carbon ion radiotherapy, short course treatment is also available. For prostate cancer, 12 fluxions treatment uh, over three weeks is standard regimen. For lung or liver cancers, it takes less than one week. Interruption of normal life of the patient is minimized and we can treat high volume patients. So this is a trend of patient number at Guma University. So far, more than 4,000 patients have received carbon ion radiotherapy. Annually, more than 700 patients can be treated this year. So uh, indicated cancers in carbon ion radiotherapies are listed here. So bone and soft tissue, tumors, head and neck, lung, liver, prostate, pancreas, leptin, GYN, and oligometastasis. So today, uh, I'd like to show some clinical outcomes, including uh, nationwide retrospective studies for uh, these three topics. The first is inoperable bone and soft tissue tumors. In operable bone and soft tissue tumors uh, known as X-ray resistant tumors, osteosarcoma uh, of the uh, pelvic bone and spine and chordoma of the sacrum and undifferentiated from pleomorphic sarcoma in the uh, lateroperitoneal uh, spaces. So uh, these uh, X-ray resistant tumors were controlled for many years. 
This table shows a comparison of survival between traditional X-ray therapy and carbonine laser therapy. In sacral chordoma, pelvic osteosarcoma, pelvic chondrosarcoma, lateroperitoneal soft tissue sarcoma, uh, carbonion radiotherapy showed favorable outcomes. So this patient had an adenocystic carcinoma of the right maxillary sinus invading to the orbital cavity. This tumor is usually X-ray resistant. So yellow circle shows a very steep dose gradation that sparing the left optic nerves. After treatment, uh, there was no local recurrence and left visual function was preserved. So one meta-analysis demonstrated that Chairs particle radiotherapy with proton or carbon ions achieved significantly better survival and local regional control in patients with paranasal sinus and nasal cavity tumors. Okay, next. Uh, this patient had a pancreatic head cancer. The tumor invaded the SMA over 180 degrees. After carbon ion radiotherapy, abnormal uptakes on FDG PET CT disappeared, but the tumor size didn't change without enhancement. So this patient underwent surgery and a pathological CR was proved. But this table shows the survival in locally advanced pancreatic cancers treated with gemcitabine with or without radiotherapy. The so treatment includes gemcitabine, X-ray plus gemcitabine, and carbon ion radiotherapy. The median survival time after carbon ion radiotherapy was around 25 months, and the two-year overall survival rate was over 50%. So which looks very promising. So uh, recent development of uh, systemic uh, therapy is very hopeful, especially in combination with carbon ion radiotherapy for such locally advanced pancreatic cancers. Because bulky tumor control is usually difficult by systemic therapy alone, and intensive treatment has an important role to produce long-term survival. Now, carbon ion radiotherapy is still limited medical resource in the worldwide. Only 13 facilities are in operation and the most of them locate in Asia. So we should cooperate among the centers in order to make high level of evidence such as uh, uh, phase three clinical trials. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee of Asian Oncology Society. It is truly a great honor and privilege to be here today. I'm Dr. Jung Min Lee from Seoul, Korea, working at Seoul National University Hospital. In this session on emerging technology in cancer, in the next 15 minutes, I'd like to talk about multi-parametric MRI for oncologic evaluation. Let me first discuss imaging techniques for evaluation of oncologic patients. For example, in patients with on abdominal cancers, MDCT is currently the worldwide imaging modality of choice for evaluation of disease extent. Uh, MRI can be used as a secondary diagnostic test or a problem-solving tool. PET-CT or PET-MR has a complementary role for tumor state T or MRI. Then what is the role of imaging in evaluation of cancer patients? Traditionally, the role of imaging is diagnosis and staging. However, in recent 
years, the role of imaging、uh, in evaluation of oncology patients has been changing, mainly because、uh, of development of、uh, surgical device and techniques. Several new therapeutic drugs, such as anti-angiogenic drugs or immunotherapeutic drugs.、Uh, furthermore, uh, new uh, radiation treatments. Uh, uh, has been、uh, have been developed, including SVRT and particle beam therapy. Indeed,、uh, evaluation of therapeutic effect of systemic treatment and restaging is getting more important.、Uh, and furthermore,、uh, precise preoperative assessment of a functional reservoir of background organs is also important. Therefore, multi-parameter evaluation of perfusion, cellularity, or cellular function、uh, is necessary. Here you can see、uh, the comparison of strengths and weaknesses of contrast-enhanced CT scan and contrast-enhanced MRI scan for evaluation of oncology patients. As you know, a CT uh, has uh, better temporal and spatial resolution uh, than MRI. Uh, on the contrary, MR has better soft tissue contrast and、uh, multi-parameter capability. You can see、uh, a good example of MR、uh, having better、uh, soft tissue contrast than CT. In these patients with sickle cancer. CT uh, uh, demonstrate a small, low attenuated lesion、uh, in the liver.、Uh, however, it is difficult to differentiate、uh, cyst versus、uh, metastasis. However, on T2 weighted imaging,、uh, due to its high signal intensity, we can easily make a diagnosis of cyst. In this,、uh, another example、uh, of 62-year-old male patients with abdominal pain and elevated、uh, amylase,、uh, CT demonstrates the diffuse swelling of the pancreas and、uh, uh, cyst in the pancreas head,、uh, which may、uh, provide a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis with a pseudocyst. However, on MR, especially on diffusion weighted imaging, you can see diffusion restriction, and also、uh, you can see a, a fluid-containing uh, lesion uh, in the center of the uh, uh, disease. Uh, later, this lesion was confirmed as a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So, due to this kind of information on cellularity、uh, from diffusion weighted imaging, we can、uh, make a correct diagnosis of.、Uh, Furthermore, according to recent publications on imaging modality uh, for uh, liver metastasis, uh, MRI with hepatobiliary contrast agent is much more accurate than CT or ECCM MRI.、Uh, in these patients with、uh, pancreatic cancer, although CT failed to detect a small liver metastasis,、uh, EOV enhanced MRI、uh, showed a small, tiny、uh, liver metastasis. With、uh, this、uh, improved detection of liver metastasis by getting EOV MR,、uh, we can change the therapeutic plan from surgical resection to systemic chemotherapy.、Uh, as we know, all accurate staging is the key element、uh, to select. Appropriate treatment uh, in a、uh, cancer patient. So, what kind of information、uh, can multi-parameter MRI、uh, provide for us? It can provide information regarding in vivo、uh, physiologic and metabolic、uh, information. It uses、uh, functional parameters like flow, tissue oxygenation, dynamic perfusion. Uh, diffusion, stiffness, and cellular function. The result of those functional imaging studies can be expressed、uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. MR allows multi-parameter approach easily. For example, proton density fat fraction can be used for evaluating hepatic steatosis. Diffusion weighted imaging can provide information about cellular density. MR elastography can provide information about tissue stiffness. DC MRI can、uh, provide information about the tumor vascularity. And with the、uh, 
hepatobiliary contrast agent, we can evaluate liver function and also hepatobiliary. Here you can see a uh, summary of uh, advantages of a multi-parameter MRI uh, in oncologic evaluation. MPMR imaging explores different functional and molecular information of abdominal malignancies in a single examination, and the combination of these different quantitative parameters can help uh, gain insight toward the tumor biology, and measurement of changes in tumor characteristics with treatment can help in therapy monitoring, radiotherapy planning, and drug development. The first example of MPMRI is MR proton density fat fraction. Uh, it requires only one breath hold exam, but provides a very accurate quantitative measurement uh, for hepatic steatosis. Therefore, it can be used as a good diagnostic test for CASH uh, uh, after uh, systemic chemotherapy. Another commonly used example of MPMRI is diffusion-weighted uh, imaging. Where can we apply diffusion-weighted imaging? In principle, in human body, cellular membrane is the major tissue to inhibit diffusion of a water molecule. As diffusion-weighted imaging can sensitively detect uh, this uh, diffusion process of water in the tissue, we can use uh, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging uh, as a surrogate marker uh, of uh, tissue cellularity. For example, tumor with high cellularity uh, can show uh, restricted diffusion, but tissue with uh, necrosis can show increased diffusion. Therefore, Diffusion-weighted imaging uh, is widely used for evaluation of a treatment response um, and also the detection of uh, malignant tumors. Uh, furthermore, it can be used as a map uh, for tumor metastasis uh, similar to uh, PET imaging. Next example of uh, MPMRI in addition, uh, tumor stiffness uh, can be measured by amylastography, and it could be associated with uh, tumor mechanical property, including uh, interstitial pressure. Uh, therefore, uh, tumor stiffness values uh, may provide uh, prognostic values of uh, some uh, malignancies, including HCC or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. According to our study, higher uh, tumor stiffness uh, provides uh, worst prognosis. In addition, uh, perfusion imaging uh, is another key component of MPMRI. Uh, what is perfusion imaging? Uh, it is the imaging which permits quantitative assessment of a perfusion such as amount of blood, velocity of blood, and extraction from intravascular and extravascular space. Perfusion imaging can visualize tumor-related angiogenesis and therefore can be used for prediction of outcome and also for early assessment of a treatment response. However, it requires high temporal resolution imaging less than 3 to uh, with the recent development of free breathing T1 uh, weighted imaging, which is a radial gradient technique uh, having uh, motion uh, insensitivity, uh, we can obtain both dynamic imaging and perfusion imaging uh, simultaneously, as this technique allows uh, imaging reconstruction with uh, different uh, temporal resolution. So using this high temporal resolution imaging set, we can obtain perfusion map. And also with this uh, uh, relatively uh, high spatial resolution imaging, we can uh, use the, uh, you can obtain the uh, anatomic information as well. The next component I'd like to uh, address uh, of MPMRI is the hepatobiliary MR contrast agent. 
approximately 50% of uh, injected get EOB DTPA can be obtained by hepatocyte uh, via OATP transporters and excreted into bile, into the bile duct via CMOT transporter. As a homogeneous and strong hepatic parenchymal enhancement could be achieved, uh, we can detect a tiny uh, liver malignancies and also uh, during hepatocarcinogenesis, OATP transporters gradually decreases. Uh, therefore, we can uh, detect only hepatocellular carcinoma, much uh, more sensitive uh, CT or ultrasound. Furthermore, get another interesting application of EOBMR is assessment of liver function. Here you can see uh, two similar cases of uh, large hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, these patients uh, were perfectly okay after surgical resection. However, uh, this bottom case uh, developed uh, liver failure after surgical resection. Uh, on hepatobiliary phase imaging, Last but not least, PET-MRI uh, can combine multi-parameter imaging capability of MRI and metabolic information of PET. Uh, here you can see two examples uh, showing the value of PET-MRI. In these patients with the pancreatic uh, adenosquamous carcinoma, after CCLT, PET-MRI uh, can provide excellent information regarding therapeutic response. Uh, we can obtain anatomic information from dynamic imaging, uh, and uh, we can also uh, obtain the uh, information regarding cellularity uh, from diffusion-weighted imaging, and also get metabolic information from PET. On pathology, there was no viable tumor. In addition, uh, with a new PET tracer, we can have uh, both uh, improved sensitivity and specificity for detection of uh, uh, prostate cancer metastasis um, on PET MRI. Here are my take-home message. Uh, MR imaging provides multiple imaging biomarkers for assessing uh, abdominal malignancies. Uh, which can be integrated in a comprehensive protocol tailored to be to the clinical problem. Uh, these uh, techniques are at various uh, stages of clinical adoption, uh, as many are technically demanding and lack uh, sufficient uh, sufficient standardization and still require further validation. The potential of all these techniques is enhanced if an MPMRI approach is used to assess tumor behavior. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kazuhiro Yoshida. It is my great honor and pleasure to chair this important session, AOS special keynote sessions. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the speakers, speakers from Korea, Professor Han Kan Yan, and also Wei Bin, Jin, Wei Bin Li from China, and uh, from uh, Tetsuya Ono, Japan, and also Professor uh, John Ming Ling from uh, Korea. And also, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for all the participants' audience. And we have already several questions. In this uh, session, we have uh, 15 minutes to discuss uh, about this uh, uh, special lectures. So first of all, I would like to ask Professor uh, Tetsuya Ono. Thank you very much and congratulations for your wonderful talk. We have one question from the audience. Can I ask you now? Okay. 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 Uh, Please let us know the difference from proton therapy and uh, carbon protein thera proton therapy. How can we use differently? Okay. Okay. The, the biological property is different between carbon ion beams and proton beams. In carbon ion um, beams, um, due to the high LET component, uh, DNA double strand break uh, commonly occurs, which results in the stronger biological effectiveness. So, 
we can expect the, the uh, efficacy uh, for uh, X-ray resistant tumors or proton resistant tumors. That's my answer. Okay, great. And the carbon iron therapy is now very, start to be popular, but very expensive to, to yes, quit. Right. Right. So that is the most most difficult hurdle to spread in in all Asian areas. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the reason of the bigger machine, big facility, uh, includes the accelerator system is uh, still large. So if we develop. Uh, more advanced technology like uh, uh, more advanced uh, accelerated system if we have, uh, so the size and cost will be reduced. So it, it can be disseminated in the Asian countries. Good news to hear. <laughs> Very nice. So, okay. Uh, probably several uh, uh, speakers will ask uh, some questions. So, Professor uh, Jomyun, Jomyun Min Lee, you are also the radiologist. Do you have any questions? Or Professor Ono, or do you have any questions to Professor Lee? Oh, thank you. Can, can I ask to Professor Lee? Yes, please. For, for cancer imaging. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, in my understanding, the functional imaging is very promising. So, uh, what do you recommend to radiation oncologists uh, about the functional functional property by MRI? Uh, you you already showed the. Uh, diffusion or perfusion or elastic uh, function or something, w which is the best? I think the, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think the diffusion weighted imaging uh, is the most commonly uh, used uh, functional imaging modality as okay. uh, it doesn't require long acquisition time and also it doesn't require any contrast injection. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, and also many MR vendors uh, provide diffusion weighted imaging as a routine sequences for uh, body and neuro MR imaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, in oncologic imaging uh, fields, diffusion uh, weighted imaging is, uh, has became, become a mm -hmm. routine uh, sequence uh, mm -hmm. for evaluation of tumors. So I think the uh, eval uh, in, uh, when you want to evaluate uh, uh, tumor response to radiation treatment, or when you uh, want to predict outcome of the tumor to uh, oncologic treatment, I think diffusion-weighted imaging uh, can provide a valuable information because it basically provides information about the cellularity. And also if you use a, a more complex post-processing tools such as uh, IVIM, uh, intravoxel uh, incoherent uh, imaging uh, technique, uh, you mm -hmm. may also acquire some microperfusion information uh, from mm -hmm. diffusion-weighted imaging. So I strongly recommend you to use uh, diffusion-weighted imaging. Oh, very interesting. Uh, recently, MRI combined with linear accelerator is commercially available. So uh, some leading center uh, can buy such a very sophisticated uh, X-ray machine. Yes, yes. <laughs> it looks like a very uh, promising uh, and yes. interesting combination. The yes. uh, standard of art uh, imaging modality and standard of art uh, radiation treatment modality are combined and basically, uh, MR can provide uh, guidance, uh, yes. excellent guidance for radiation treatment. Mm -hmm. And also, it can provide insight to 
monitoring of the tumor response. So I yeah. believe you may uh, enjoy uh, the yeah. uh, fruitful combination of two imaging modalities. Yes. Yes, yes even uh, for surgeons, MLI is a very, uh, very good tool to detect uh, liver metastasis. Previously, yes. we say that there was no liver metastasis, but with the MRI image, we have many small yes. nodules which could not be detected by CT. So yes. I agree with the MRI, uh, very useful. Uh, Lee, Professor Lee, uh, yes. one question from Dr. Hadi Luna. Yes. Uh, what are the advantages of MRI over PET CT? Are there historical tumors which can be seen clearly with MRI versus PET? Mm -hmm. Can you answer it? I, yes, uh, I think the MRI uh, can uh, provide a better diagnostic accuracy than the PET CT for liver metastasis, as you said. Uh, nowadays, uh, we are using uh, hepatocyte-specific contrast agent, get the EOB DTPA, and also diffusion-weighted imaging. Uh, by combining diffusion-weighted imaging and uh, hepatobiliary contrast agent to enhanced MRI, uh, MR can detect uh, very minute uh, liver metastasis uh, very sensitively. Uh, for PET-CT, I think... Uh, uh, at least uh, five to 10 millimeter uh, diameter tumors, uh, tumor size is necessary to detect the liver metastasis. And furthermore, there are some histological variants which may not show increased uh, metabolic activity on PET-CT, while MR can uh, detect uh, such kind of tumors based on soft tissue contrast. So I think uh, MR uh, definitely can add additional benefit to PET-CT. Uh, of course, PET-CT uh, can be used as a one-stop shopping tool with a contrast injection uh, while obtaining PET information. But the uh, basic uh, advantage of a PET-MR could be uh, dependent on uh, advantages of MR over CT uh, in oncology evaluation. But the problem of uh, PET-MR is uh, it's a high cost. Mm. Okay. Uh, Press uh, Waving Lee probably is not yet on lives, but uh, Press uh, Jomin Lee, uh, MLI is also useful for diagnosing meningitis carcinomatosas. Uh, is it effective? Is the MRI useful for the treatment result of uh, CSF dissemination? Uh, I missed you uh, in early uh, part of your question. Would you repeat your question one more time? Um, meningitis carcinomatosa. Ah. Uh, Professor Wei-Bin Li from China has demonstrated uh, clearly that the intra uh, uh, chemotherapy is useful by uh, the MRI <laughs> imaging. <Yeah. laughs> Unfortunately, I am not a, a specialist for neuroimaging. I am yeah. a body, uh, I'm a surgeon. No. <laughs> so, uh, I cannot uh, provide a good answer for your question. Okay. Professor Ono, any comments? or Just a, a, a few words uh, to Dr. Professor Lee. Uh, Seoul National University will have a carbonine facility in Busan. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> hope to see you again. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> and uh, Professor Han Kanyan is also working with Professor Lee, is it? Am I yes, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, he's also uh, presented very nicely. So, do you collaborate with the a AI or uh, Image guided surgery, or do you collaborate? Uh, uh, <laughs> actually, the uh, uh, he developed his own research team. So mm -hmm. uh, I do not have direct uh, collaborative relationship uh, with him regarding AI guided uh, uh, surgery. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
you have a very big hospitals and many people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our goal as a surgeon is the auto surgery, like an mm -hmm. auto drive mm -hmm. for safety. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So the uh, virtual reality images and the mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. want to use such kind of things. So mm -hmm. radiologists are very important for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, Presa Ono. Yes. One more question concerning the th th carbon proton pro carbon therapy. Yes. Uh, do you combine with chemotherapy with uh, with that heavy met heavy metal yeah. carbon therapy? For example, for uh, pancreatic cancer, we concurrently combine with uh, gemcitabine or TS1, and followed by systemic chemotherapy again, and for yeah, because uh, Guma University is a university hospital, so one of our advantage is to develop such a new combination, uh, carbon ion radiotherapy with existing uh, other modality, including surgery. Yes. <laughs> so you have a new knife. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Oh, now, Professor Yan, you are on now. We are discussing about Hello, the... Professor. Yes, Professor Yoshida, sorry, uh, my operation today, uh, the uh, second one, it went uh, uh, longer than I expected. Uh, please uh, see my uh, specimen here. All uh, right. I don't know whether... Uh, okay. I can uh, see you. Okay, can Great. you see? The specimen? No, the problem is we have uh, quite a uh, long enough uh, margin proximal, but yeah, the problem yeah, here is a uh, uh, look like more a than three small, centimeters. small uh, potential uh, or another other cancer. So uh, we are now uh, uh, waiting for the frozen. So uh, oh, I'm sorry I, I missed yeah. the, the first part of the discussion. The tumor is located in the greater curvature, and it looks like a fully differentiated adenocarcinoma of the wow. stomach. Wow, Professor <laughs> Yoshida, you have a microscope in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, we enjoyed your presentation very much. So, I just uh, uh, talked with Lee that our goal is the safety drive you have presented. Mm -hmm safety surgery mm -hmm. so what is uh, your project now oh in your team project uh, for for a surgery for for education oh for education oh no uh, using uh, uh, image guided surgery uh, yes uh, actual uh, our current yes we uh, actually today uh, this case, uh, I uh, also used a near infrared camera for and uh, ICG injection. But the, mm -hmm. the problem here in Korea is ICG injection for uh, lymphatic uh, identification in gastric cancer is not permitted yet by oh, FDA, Korean F FDA. So mm -hmm. this patient simply the patient uh, agreed to uh, perform uh, and. Uh, 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 that is a demonstration or a clinical setting, uh, tr clinical set, uh, trial setting. So uh, that's the limitation, but still, uh, this is a, a, a potential uh, future uh, uh, application. I mean, as I presented, uh, uh, ICG is uh, at this moment, uh, uh, at least it's good for uh, surgeons who have a limited experience about DTD section because Professor Yoshida, you are D to D section. You don't need uh, ICG, but uh, for surgeons who have limited and uh, it uh, visualize uh, lymphatic channels, so that's uh, uh, one uh, uh, upcoming yes. uh, our uh, educational purpose. Thank you very much, Professor Yam. Mm. Uh, time is nearly up, so oh yeah, sorry. So thank you very much for all the participants and all the great speakers, and I hope you in good health and uh, see you after COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
。さよなら。<笑>